I want to show you another way to solve this particular proof. It's an inequality result that uh, we could do with just sort of strict algebra. That was the first approach that we took. Uh, but I want to show you there's another sort of perspective you can take on this, which is not more efficient or more elegant than the previous solution method. Um, however, um, as an additional perspective on this problem, I think it's always valuable to take another different angle. Um, that's the first thing to note. Uh, and secondly, um, for another problem, this approach might actually be more efficient, um, more succinct, depending on the kind of problem that you encounter. So it's always good to have you know, more tools in your toolbox, even if it's not the best tool for this particular task, it might be for another one. So let's just remember what this is asking us. We get given this pair of numbers A and B, we're told that they add up to 6 and that they're both positive and then this is the inequality result that we have to prove. Now like I said before you can just sort of go at this with sort of an algebraic hacksaw um, and find some squares in there that are going to be positive, you know take everything over to the left hand side try and prove that that whole expression is going to be greater than or equal to zero and that worked fine. However, um, I want you to notice that when you think about this object over here, 1 over a plus 1 over b, we can actually use it uh, as kind of a, a launch pad for actually thinking about this visually, graphically. Um, we can think about what does this look like as a picture? Can I, can I get a sense of what this should look like on like a two-dimensional set of axes? And then can I show that when I add these two things together, it's always going to be greater than or equal to two-thirds. That's another approach that we could take. Now, admittedly, when you have a look at this, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. Even if I think I want to visualize this, uh, it might not be obvious to you how you would go about doing that. So let me kind of nudge you along the way. For starters, I'll admit it doesn't look much like something to graph when you look at this because um, there's an A and a B rather than say X's and Y's, right? Um, that's what we're used to graphing, Y equals something or other in terms of X. Um, I want you to remember that these are just labels, right? Just because we usually call it an X axis, there's no reason why it has to be. We could just as easily have an A axis or a time axis or a population axis. So these labels um, can be arbitrarily changed and so we shouldn't just sort of expect like uh, this is just locked into thinking about this algebraically but I do need to do a little bit of work to make it more obvious how I can visualize this. So I noticed that in the question I get this relationship between A and B and what that will allow me to do is to turn this which is a two variable expression, it's got an A in it and a B, I can use this A plus B equals 6 to do some rearrangement and substitution to eliminate one of these variables. So I don't just have, I don't have A and B, I'll have just A or just B. So one way I could do that is say for example if I take this over here and say um, a plus b equals 6 so therefore it stands to reason that b will be equal to 6 take away a. Therefore I can substitute that in to this expression here. I can have a 1 over a plus 1 over 6 minus a and if I had that as you know x's instead if I had 1 over x plus 1 over 6 minus x, this looks a whole lot more familiar. Like, oh, I think I know what this looks like. I can graph it. Now, before we go off and do that, um, there are a couple of other things I want to take note of. Um, I'm not actually going to do this in terms of x's because um, there's no specific reason we have to. As I pointed out, the labels, the pronumerals are arbitrary. Um, so I'm actually going to leave it in terms of a's. So um, I'll just put those uh, x's away and uh, replace them with A. So this is what I'm going to deal with. Uh, and then secondly, I want you to note, um, we have this restriction here. We noted that A and B had to be positive. Now, that means that when I have a look at this, I already have the fact that A is greater than zero. A is greater than zero, that's known. Um, but I also can say, um, not only does A have to be bigger than something, there's actually also an upper bound um, on A. A has to be lower than a certain value. And I wonder if you can spot what the upper bound is before I tell you. Um, there's at least two ways to be able to see um, that A can't be any bigger than a certain amount. And that's gonna be important for us when we're graphing because then I don't need to graph the whole thing, I just need to graph number one, um, the part that's greater than zero, and then number two, the part that's less than, some other value. So the first thing you can say is, well let's have a look at this, right? A and B, they add together to give you 6, right? Both A and B have to be positive. So you can see here, A can't be arbitrarily large, right? If A was say something like 10, then 10 plus B equals 6, B would have to be negative, in this case negative 4, and that violates what I know about B. B has to be positive. So um, A can't be 10, 
A can't be nine. A can't be eight or seven. A can't even be six because then if I had six plus B equals six, B would have to be exactly zero and I know I can't be zero. Um, B has to be, like I said, strictly positive. So therefore, um, I can say, well, just looking at that and the fact that B has to be positive, A has to be less than six. I can reason that through um, and you can see I've got not just an, a lower bound but an upper bound. If that's a bit too uh, hand wavy and intuitive for you, there's an algebraic way to show that as well, which maybe you would find um, easier to accept. Uh, if you go back to, let's say, uh, I'm going all color crazy today. Um, if you go back to this restriction that B is going to be greater than zero, we can go back to uh, this result here that I used to eliminate B and say it's six minus A. From that, I can say, well, that means six minus A also has to be greater than zero. Six minus A is after all equal to B. So therefore it only takes a little bit of rearrangement. I mean, if I, so I'll leave A on the left hand side because it's gonna be the subject, but I'll subtract six from both sides and then I'll multiply through by negative one, remembering that multiplying both sides of an inequality by a negative changes the direction of the inequality. And there you go, A is less than six, there's my upper bound. So. What I could say in place of this is that actually I'm considering a between naught and six. So now think about what this is going to look like. Could we graph this shape from uh, in the domain naught to six? Could we graph this shape in the domain naught to six? And the answer is absolutely we can. So uh, let's have a go at doing this uh, reasonably uh, neatly and see what we get here, right? So if I were to draw um, a graph here, and um, oh, that's a terrible straight line, let's try that again. I'm happy with that. Uh, if we think about this first object here, let's think about the one over A, uh, do this in purple. Um, one over A is the hyperbola, right? Um, and I'm only considering just the one part of it. So rather than like the whole thing, like so, um, I only need the part from naught to six. So here I am from naught, I'll never get to the asymptote anyway. And then I go along some distance to get to six. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw that like so. And um, that can go off into, you know, towards that asymptote as far as uh, we like. And then I'm gonna have an open circle over the the end for six. So there is uh, one over A within this domain. So I might, maybe I'll label that one over A. Now, what does one over six minus A look like in the same domain? Um, how can we understand the picture of that? Well, think about this in two ways. Number one, you can see there's going to be a horizontal reflection that's happening here, right? So you're gonna get a shape that is um, not, not going up and then decreasing. It's gonna be um, from the bottom and then increasing, right? So it's been flipped around. Uh, and then secondly, it's been shifted six units. So in fact, you're essentially gonna get this shape, but you're gonna get it backwards, right? So therefore, I can say I'm gonna get a uh, hollow circle over here and then I'm going to be increasing and I'll approach um, just like I had an asymptote at zero here for one over A, I'm gonna have an asymptote at six. Um, I guess it's gonna line up with this hollow circle like so, I really should put both, shouldn't I? So we're gonna get an asymptote over here. Uh, and don't forget, this is not an X axis, this is an A axis. Um, and if I call this whole thing, y, and this is my y axis, and here is y equals one over six minus a. So you can see, you know, you obviously can't substitute six into there, so that's why you're approaching this asymptote. Okay, now remember I was pointing out that there's a symmetry to this, right? Because it's been flipped over and it's been moved, uh, you know, six units horizontally, right? That means you might be able to, even off my diagram, which is not that great a diagram, but I think it's good enough, you might be able to tell what this critical point right here is, right? Because there is this symmetry, it's gonna be exactly halfway between zero and six. So you can see by the symmetry here, and it's not difficult, you could solve these two simultaneously if you really wanted. Uh, but this point here is going to be three. Um, and you can therefore say, oh, if the A coordinate is three, then when you substitute A into either of these curves here and here, you're gonna get Y equals one over three, a third, right? So maybe I will draw that across like so. So there's that vertical value. And now what I'm doing is I'm adding these two things together, right? So I'm adding, at that point there, I'm adding one graph which is equal to a third and another graph which is equal to a third. A third plus a third, last I checked, is equal to 
two thirds, right? Now, two thirds should grab your attention because you're like, hold on a second. That's what this question here was saying. Uh, when I add these two things together, I should be greater than or equal to two thirds. So what that tells me, this spot here, let's just draw this across as well. Sorry, my uh, scale's not the greatest, but it's enough for illustration. That apparently is the lowest that I'm going to get, right? So how do I actually prove that that is the case. Um, I, I'm guessing, I'm anticipating, if indeed this is true, that um, the lowest this can possibly go um, is going to be two thirds. I'm guessing I'm going to get some sort of shape roughly like this, right? Um, which as you can see, two thirds is where it bottoms out and so you're greater than or equal to that value, okay? 